My name is Claude Hendrickson. I'm the founder of Frontline Community Self Build, which was a project that was done in 1994. We started out as a group in 1988. It took us five years to get on site. So this project has been built over 20 years. I always say 92,000 bricks, 52,000 blocks, 12 semi-detached houses built by a group of African Caribbean guys from Chapel Town. What I say about myself is I was born, educated and brought up in Chapel Town, so I've lived in Chapel Town all my life. The site we actually got was in Round Hay, and that was because it was the worst site at that time they could give us. This site was an ex-quarry, ex-stone quarry, because you know Leeds is famous for Yorkshire stone. We had to do like a hundred thousand pounds worth of work underground. We went down, the contractor went down twice as high as the houses are up to clear underneath. All of the houses are on floating foundations because the houses that were here before were demolished because of subsidence. So each block of two is on, on its own foundation base. So if there's any movement, subsidence is not a problem. For my sins, since doing Frontline Self Build, I'd like to think I've been an advocate for community-led housing. I found a member of the Community Self Build Agency, which is a national agency, which was looking at promoting self build nationally and all the strands of community-led housing. Because I'm not just about promoting self build, I'm about empty homes, I'm about refurbs, I'm about anything to do with empowering local people to be involved in solving the housing issue that we do have. I now am the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Advisor to Leeds Community Homes. I'm also the first national uh, accredited black male community-led housing advisor in the UK, certified by the Chartered Housing Institute. So what I'm doing now with, community, with Leeds Community Homes, I am trying to encourage more being black and ethnic minority people. And when I say black and ethnic minority, that's one strand of my work. I'm also looking at other minority groups, such as people with disability, LGBT groups, any groups that are minority groups. I'm looking right now at homelessness amongst refugees, so I'm working with many groups, Leeds posit Poverty, many other groups right now. So that's what I do for now. I'm based in principle at the Leeds West Indian Centre, which is based in Chapel Town. I would say back in the mid 80s, there was a lot of stereotypical view of black men and black boys. And there was this thing about high crime and that black men didn't want to work and black men didn't want to get into construction, which I found a strange thing because at that time they were actually rebuilding Chapel Town. They were knocking down some big houses, which I'll show you some of the houses later. They were knocking down houses. So when we decided to build these houses, it was because of high unemployment in our community, a negative stereotypical view of black people. So that was fundamentally, and we wanted to prove that given the right support, a group, a local group could it was very much for me about proving that a group of unemployed people given the right support could do a project like this and as well I was trying to defeat a stereotypical view of black men at the time. We had many apprentices come on site with us that were not black and come and work with us from the construction training colleges but for me my driving thing was I wanted evidence because it's quite funny um, when I attended an event at Civic Hall, Leeds Civic Hall and we would they were discussing the idea it was quite funny the, the then principal of Leeds University stood up in the council chamber and said that there was no evidence in Leeds University that a group of black men working together could achieve anything so that was the uphill thing I was up against and that that inspired me actually because uh, I said to him, by the time I've finished with this, you will have something in your university. And 
And then with the work I've done nationally, it's been supporting all kinds of group. I've done, I've been involved with supporting quite a few groups in Bristol, which was doing community self-build for ex, ex-military bods. Because I don't know if you know that 60 to 70% of all homeless men are actually ex-military uh, who have fallen off their luck. So we've done quite a few projects in Bristol. You know, I've visited projects in Scotland, in Sunderland, in Walls End, Brighton, oh gosh, all over the country. I've been all over, in the last 20 years, I've been all over the country. So yeah, so that's what drove me. Yes, it was an all black group, but again, due to society and how society viewed us back then, I wanted some firm evidence. This is my greatest achievement in my life, actually doing this after my children and my grandchildren, this is definitely my shining glory. I feel anyway, um, I'm really proud that we did this. Frontline Close actually were a group of unemployed black guys, myself included. I'd been unemployed for eight years. We were all unemployed, hanging around the streets. I was, I was about 28 years old. So that's who we were, just a group of unemployed black guys that, um, couldn't find work at the time and, and actually because we were single couldn't find housing neither. The name Frontline actually came from the fact that the group used to be on the Hayfield car park which was classed as the Frontline. So we took, when we were looking for a name for our project, that's where we took the name from. They said we're from the Frontline so we're going to call it Frontline. Well if this true story be known it wasn't the council as an institution. It was an in, it's been individuals of part of institutions that were supportive. So we was extremely lucky that the then director of housing, who was a, a gentleman who went by the name of Eric Bowen, he himself, because he was retiring, had decided within himself that he was going to push this project, and he heard our story and he was behind us and then the other significant individual was a gentleman called Peter Redman who was the then chief executive of Lee's Federated Housing. Those two individuals as individuals not their organizations were the ones that made the change so it's not necessarily the institution of the local authority because the departments of the local authority put up barriers as we was going along. So there was planning, there was this, there was that, there was all these other finding land, you know. So Eric Bowen from Leeds City Council, cause he was the head of housing, he put his stamp on it. It's a good point that about it being more than about housing, because if, if I take a step back, what happened, what was happening in Chapel Town back in the mid eighties when the then conservative government created the housing corporation was that a housing association called at the time they were called Harewood Housing. They came to our area and talked about they were going to be building houses in our area and they said that when they would be building these new houses they would create employment for men. Our fathers because a lot of our fathers came from the Caribbean and they had construction skills but they couldn't get jobs. So they said that they would be not just building houses in Chapel Town, they would also be creating employment for local people. It never happened. They built houses, there wasn't one black person on them building sites. So I wanted for our forefathers, our parents, my stepfather and them, I wanted to prove for them as well. For me, doing Frontline was more than just about building houses. It was one, about building houses, two, about showing a community group working together could deliver it. Three, it was about giving them self-builders employable skills that they could then go on and create enterprise. So they could go on and create local contractors that could tender to the city council. Because for example, our area had something like, back then something like a five million pound maintenance contract every year. And we, our hope was that we could be taking on some of that maintenance contract and giving jobs to, to the men and to their children that were coming along. So it was more than, yes, it was more than just about housing for me. It was about creating skills. That's why Frontline 
historically probably was one of the more our self builders came off of site probably the most accredited self build group probably in history I don't I, I, I'll say that but I'm not sure they came off some of them came off with NVQ level twos in their different trades some of them even came off with NVQ level three so they were employable and, and that's and we was hoping that we would get work from local housing associations we would get work from the city council so it was more than just building housing it was building a community building employment training and all of that for me, the long lasting impact is best part of 25 years later, we're stood here today and you can see the quality of the houses. So the lasting impact is that this was done by a group of unemployed people, but a quarter of a century, it's still here. They're still in pristine situation. You can see the whole area. I mean, in the summer, it's fantastic. That's number one. Number two, I can bring other people here now to see it. Number three, it inspired a sector of community-led housing in, 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 in Leeds. So Latch, Canopy, all of these projects have come after Frontline. I think that the West Yorkshire Mayor can learn that instead of people on the housing list being part of the problem, they can actually be part of the solution. You know, giving people the support to build and be involved. So for example, Leeds has to build between 50 and 70,000 houses over the next 10 years. Let's ring fence. I did some research for Leeds City Council a couple of years ago where I put together a 10 year strategy. And within that 10 year strategy, it was like 30 houses a year for the next 10 years. That's only 300 houses. So out of 50,000, that's only 300. So 49,700 would still be built the normal way so that could be like this is a project of 12 houses so you could have three projects of 10 in the city of Leeds every year for the next 10 years that would only be 300 houses and across West Yorkshire I think West Yorkshire has to deliver something like 120,000 houses so again I would replicate that kind of platform in Bradford, Huddersfield and in surrounding areas the thing that's stopping that initially from happening is that some people think there's a certain way things should be done you know they think that people should wait on the system to solve their problems i think the system needs to look at how we can be involved in solving our problem yeah so you were saying um what more needs to be done i think um there needs to be an acceptance that instead of people with, with housing issues being seen as a problem, how can they be involved in the solution? You know, we have this problem. It, you know, I often say that back when they had the Second World War and they bombed England, it built itself, you know, it actually went back to the people and says, listen, let's all get in this together, let's solve this problem. What you can see here, for example, is the way the houses were built what we had to do, the whole, the whole of the row was demolished because of subsidence, so we had to build down the centre of the quarry. What you'll notice, we've got massive areas at the front, massive car parking spaces and massive gardens. We had to, when we was building, make sure we didn't undermine that wall there and them houses that were on that side. What you can see there is them two houses that have now been converted into four bedroom houses. We had 12 guys start out myself number 13 all 12 got a house all 12 of them got a house all of them ended up in a shared ownership situation with Leeds federated housing so they each owned 25 percent for their sweat equity the other 75 percent they would pay rent to Leeds federated housing and then they had the option at any time they wanted to buy out chunks of the other 75%. So like that lady said up there, she bought 25% that that member had. Yep. And then what she's gone and done is gone and bought out the rest of the property. Well, th there's lots of issues and those that there's still about seven of them still in the houses. And it's something we're looking in the near future to go back to Leeds Federation and discuss because the deal was done that 
The self builder owns 25%, but they also take on the maintenance of the property. So that means Leeds Federated Housing has not paid no maintenance on this property for 25 years, but they're collecting rent for 25 years, three quarters of the property. So there needs to be some discussion. And if I was advising another group going forward to go into a share owner situation, I would look at it very different now. There has to be a point in history when the self built so for example, when we built these houses, they were valued at £52,000 each. So each house on average cost about £35,000 to build, but then the value was 52 k So each self builder got 25%, which was about £12,500. 12, £12 now these houses, are worth they were worth 52 they're now worth 180,000 so the housing association actually gets three quarters of a 180,000 pounds house they own that and as you go along to buy out the chunks becomes more expensive so my argument is that they should be allowed to buy out the chunks at original rates not at the profit that has been gained on the property that they have maintained for 30, 25 years to keep the value of the property up. So there's a discussion here I'm looking to have with Leeds Federated Housing. And because I'm the person that was involved in starting the project, it was my idea. I've got the whole life of the project. So it's going to be, I'm hoping it's going to be easy because after 25 years, I'm really saying it. You know, give the self builders the houses because you've made you've made you've made your money off of them. You know, what are the benefit what are the benefit of you for the six that live in here, right? Because they're they're in a catch twenty two situation. They can't buy out at the new rate of the property. Because they were unemployed, they wouldn't have got a mortgage anyway. Back then we were looking at going with I think it was the provincial building society. And if you go back to 1990, 1991, that was the a financial crash before the last one we had in, in 2008. There was also a, a financial crash then in 1991. So we were building our houses against the backdrop of 40,000 houses being repossessed at that time because the interest rates went crazy and the Provincial Building Society, which was, I think, was one of the biggest loaners to self-build. Milton Keynes was more or less built by them. Went bust because of negative equity, which was a new word in the housing world. So, yeah, it was, um, we built, when I think back, we built, originally we were going for outright ownership and then we had to negotiate a shared ownership deal. Otherwise, the project wouldn't have happened. There is no set model for any group. I think you have to look at your group, you have to look at their strengths and their weaknesses, and then you have to determine which strand of community-led housing suits you. I'm not an exponent that says everybody should be doing self-built. I'm saying there's many options under the community-led housing sector. You have to look at which one suits you. Is it co-housing? Is it the empty homes programme? Is it self-built? Is it shared ownership? Is it self-built for rent? Is it self-built for full ownership? Which, there's lots of different strands of, of community-led housing. We had lots of barriers to break down to get this project done. First, they said, go and find a site. We did find a site up near Round Hay Park, a beautiful site. Up up in the richest area up there, we found a fantastic site. It says, oh no. And it was funny, we found two sites, that one up there and another one in Hare Hills. And then they realized we were serious. So then they offered us six sites to look at. And this site that we actually took was the worst site. I realized at the time, let us take the worst site and make it work because it's better for us. Even when we were looking at sites, they were saying, well, which, which form of self-build do you want to do? And they were offering us kind of timber frame, the Walter Siegel version. And we says, no, we don't want that. We wanted to do traditional build because we was of the opinion that if we did Walter Siegel back then, they would have said it was Mickey Mouse housing. They would have said, that's not real house building. 
so we went for traditional build. What we also managed to do was secure having a, built, a training centre built for us. So they built this training centre. They built a training centre in Cowper Terrace in Hare Hills, behind the Compton Community Building. So we had our own construction centre where we went up there and we built miniature versions of all of the house. So we did it all. They, they had practice, they had training, and we were fortunate as well to secure the funding from Red Nose Charity Projects to employ our site foreman, who actually was our trainer at the training centre as well. So he knew the guys, he knew them really well. He knew their strengths and their weaknesses. All self-builders went through like a six-week taster course where they did each week they did a different trade. They did plumbing, a week of plumbing, a week of bricklaying, a week of joinery, a week of general operatives, a week of roofing, so that the trainer could find out their skills, their best skills. Other people were there, but in principle, it was for us. But obviously, we were only 12 people. So it gave them the opportunity to give other people opportunity to come and do construction training as well. To tell you the truth, we went to all training providers. We went to the College of Building, they weren't interested. We went to Leeds City Council, had training, construction training, bots, they weren't interested. So we ended up finding our training through Henry Boot Construction. They had a training centre way, way up in Seacroft and we went and visited it. And Henry Boots decided, you know, we like this idea, we like this project. So they became supportive. So that's how we got the construction training. So self-build, to me, is, an, is a British tradition. It's just that it's been kept away from the poor in Britain. Do you get what I'm saying? It's being kept away from the disadvantaged. That's the power that the affluent have. They own land. You get what I'm saying? In London, down south, Brighton, them kind of leafy districts, it's, it's a big thing. It's mainly done by people with money and quantity surveyors and people like that purchase land and build their own homes. So it's been, the elite were doing it more. But if an architect and a quantity surveyor did it, you wouldn't even think anything of it because you say, oh, well, he's an architect. It's what they do, yeah. it's what they do for a living. Well, it's about raising the profile, yeah. about raising the profile. It's about making a case to our local authority. It's about lobbying government. It's about lobbying and getting them because they've done it a certain way forever. So they think we'll just keep doing it the way we've always done it. But actually, it's not solving the problem. We're still ending up with people wanting housing. People on, you know, I think Leeds has something like 23,000 people waiting on the housing list. 23,000, some of them could be waiting on the housing list for the next five, six years. And in the interim, they have to rent private housing, which might not be up to standard. So it's really about convincing local authorities, the government, those that are in power, that let's engage these people. If you've got 23,000, I did some work for the College of Building convincing, and I'd go down to the job centre and I'd just walk down the queue and I'd just ask guys, would you like to do a bit of construction training? And, and, and the College of Building looked at me and thought, well, you know, why, why, why have we not even thought of that? And then the staff were upset because they were like, well, you've made us look a bit stupid here. Because I'm saying, well, you want more people to do construction training and you've got queues of people standing at the job centre. Go down there every day and just ask. Ask them, would you like to learn joinery? Or put them on a six-week taster. You get what I'm saying? And let them find out what construction is about, you know. That happens to be one of my ambitions now. The community-led housing sector in Leeds, I feel, needs to create and develop a construction training centre just for community-led housing groups, where all them groups can go and learn. Even if, you know, learn a bit about plumbing, learn a bit about electrics, learn a bit about 
roofing. But in Leeds, it's like, I remember when um, I finished in Leeds and I went down to Civic Hall to meet the head of training. And I walked in his office and he says to me, um, I sa he says, well done, Claude. I says, yeah, man, wow, great. He says, but you're only as good as your last 10 seconds. So what are you going to do next? I thought, what the hell are you talking about? I've just taken 12 unemployed guys through a five-year process. They've built their own houses, proved you all wrong. And now you're asking me, what am I going to do next? My argument is, if, that I, was, if I was you, a white young guy that had done this in the system, I'd have been, I'd have probably, today, 20 years later, I'd probably be the head of housing of Leeds City Council. You get what I'm saying? Because they would have seen the benefits of what I'd achieved. But no, they didn't. They kind of like threw me back out to the dogs. I would have followed in the footsteps of Eric Bowen. And I would have, by now, Leeds would have been doing far more housing projects like this. You know, I've done other projects in the meantime because other kinds of things because I couldn't get in. You know, I opened the first internet access point in the city of Leeds, community access point. I opened that, I, I did that as a shared, as um, a living above shops project with Unity Housing. I opened Yes Cyber, it used to be down on Chapel Town Road. Funny enough, remember I said that that senior council officer said to me, um, Right, you're only as good as your last 10 seconds. What are you going to do next? So I thought, bloody hell. I thought, well, all right, front line was bricks and mortar. And uh, I started working with young people. So I thought, um, I'd been to Europe and I'd seen the internet was going to be a big thing. I didn't know what it was, but I just know they were all talking about everything was www.www. And I'm saying, well, what's this www bloody dot? So, I went to Europe, I took some young people on an exchange to Europe and we found out, I found out that in Europe, all the kids in Europe were learning about the internet. So I, that was my ambition, so I wanted to open an internet cafe, a youth inquiry service with internet access. Then I um, approached Unity Housing, they got us a shop, we converted it into an internet cafe and a youth inquiry service and um, I opened that on Chapel Town Road, so that was my Millennium Project. I opened that on the 4th of January 2000. So it was like I've done bricks and mortar, and now I've done technology and internet. So I have them now as my evidence of what can be achieved. So this is a latch project, and what they do, they get houses like this and convert them. Latch is more trying to give to get property and do them up for people to live in and and they do a bit of training but not as much an in-depth training that i did you know when we were doing the research i asked them you know what level of qualification do you try and get your your builders in on and that's it's not a priority i made it a priority within frontline that all our people got construction accredited they've done other stuff they they created a little workshop a joinery workshop so they are trying a little bit to get people skilled up but I don't think I don't think any project in Leeds have tried at the level that we did to get people qualified in, in construction training skills to make them giving them a house is okay because if you've got somebody that's down on their luck and you take them through a process where we give will give you a house but you don't give them skills they then end up just being a person in a house. They still need that get up and go to become employable. You get what I'm saying? But latch, latch canopy, gypsum, fantastic projects. I would push a little more. That's why I was saying to you, one of my ambitions would be to create a training, a construction training center that is just for community led participants where you get, they get proper training and get accredited. But that, that would be separate from the College of Building. But what I would do, I would tie it into the College of Building. So all accreditation is done by the College of Building. But the actual training might be done somewhere else. Because I think if Joe Bloggs gives you accreditation in bricklaying, 
and the College of Building gives you accreditation in bricklaying. When you go for a job, you're more likely to get that job because the College of Building have given you the accreditation than Joe Blogs. So that's so I don't think it needs to be separate from the College of Building, but I think it needs to be run to the benefit of the community-led housing sector. And now historically I become I become the connectivity to actually what happened you know and I'm not looking at it as an individual person that was in the project that built the house but I looked at all the intricate parts of it I had to, we had to identify an architect we had to identify a quantity surveyor I had to do the negotiations um, with um, local authority one day I was called into the office by the director of Leeds Federated Housing he says right we want to support this project but I need you to go and negotiate a hundred and fifty thousand pounds overdraft with the bank and if you can get a hundred and fifty thousand pounds overdraft facility the project's gonna happen so he sent me out and so <laughs> you know what am I selling I'm selling this group of unemployed black guys and I've got to go and negotiate £125,000 over and was. I went to my local bank. My local bank says, um, we, fantastic idea you've got, Claude, fantastic. Um, but I'm, the only, I'm only a branch manager. I can set you up with a £10,000 overdraft. If you want, what I can do is I can organise you to go and meet the area manager. So he organised me to meet the area manager. I went and met the area manager. The area manager says, oh, well, I can only guarantee you, in principle, a £50,000 overdraft. So he stamped that for me. So then he put me on to the regional bank manager. So I went and sat down with him, give him all the spiel. Great idea, fantastic idea. He turns around to me and says to me, all right, he says, he says to me, I manage the accounts for, for Leeds City Council, the colleges, I manage all the big accounts. He says, listen, I'll tell you what to do. He says, you go back to Leeds City Council and you say to them that if you start the project and you fail, they'll pick up the pieces, they'll complete the houses and they'll have the houses for the next hundred years. So they should underwrite it. So I went back, told the chair of Leeds Fed what the bank manager said to me. He shook my hand and said to me, well done. He went to Leeds City Council and says, listen, you will underwrite it. He doesn't need to get that 150 grand overdraft because you're Leeds City Council. What are you talking about? So that's how we got that through. So that was my last test. And then it was all papers signed. Let's get this thing happening. I, I mean, I've been amazed that that it's not as well supported as it should be because like I would say back in Africa and back in the Caribbean as I've traveled over in my life now I found out that whether you're a school teacher whether you're a solicitor whether you're a nurse or a doctor in them places you would be involved in building your own house even if it meant just pushing the wheelbarrow even if it meant just doing stuff painting the outside of your own house but in England they've got this mentality that like I was saying to, again to Neil that they've got 23,000 people on the housing waiting list and they'll just say to them in Britain they tell you wait there we'll sort it out for you but it might take us 10 years we'll sort it out don't worry and so these people have to go and live in private housing, rented housing, with unscrupulous landlords until their number comes up on the Leeds City Council list and says, oh, we've got a property for you. It's balmy. Yeah. It's balmy in this modern time. You know, it's balmy, you know. And what we watched them in Leeds do, in Chapel Town, we had streets of houses with houses like this and they demolished them. And why were they demolishing them? They were demolishing them because they hadn't maintained them well. Yeah. If they'd have maintained them, right, they wouldn't have needed to demolish them. You only demolish derelict houses because they become derelict. But why have they become derelict? Because you've not maintained them.
take this road on take this street on Chapel Town in Chapel and this is Spencer place this was the red light street this was where the prostitute ladies used to be at one time you could pick up a house on this street for 25k Spencer place you cannot buy a house on this street for less than 200,000 pounds because in the past it used to be location 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 but now it's about size of house, size of accommodation, how close do you live to the city centre. We've got people now from Harrogate buying houses here now. Because I grew up at the other end of this street, right at the other end. Right, there used to be a gate here, a big gate. They used to shut Chapel Town, they used to shut it. Because this was a predominant, look at, look at the house, look at the house there, you know. You, you go to London or Harrogate or somewhere and you see that house. That house is worth like three million pounds. You get what I'm saying? You look at that. You know, the architecture in some, you look at some of the houses around here. You know, because this was a predominantly Jewish area first. Okay. And then when the, Jew, when the Irish came, then it changed, you know. But this was affluent, this was near the city centre. There was a big gate down the bottom, right down there. There was this big metal gate. There was one at that far end, and there was so they could shut this road. When we was kids, when I was a child, right at the far end of this is where I grew up from. I was five years old, Leopold Street, Chaco Co Housing, Chapel Town Co Housing. There are a few black people in it, but because the project is actually being built by contractors it's not the same as Frontline. So your membership is different because you're not actually delivering trades. So I think the chairman's a, a local black person and there's a couple of other members. So yeah, that's as, as, that's as much as I really know about Chaco, other than I have a lot of time for its founder, Bill Phelps. I think the concept of Chaco is brilliant. I think um, the co-housing as a strand of community-led housing is a good, you know, it, it brings people together to try and create communities and it's taken some of the bits like Lilac has, you know, where they'll have a common place where they all do their washing so you won't have an individual washing machine in all 28 houses. You'll have an area where there's a number of washing machines and they're going to have a bit of a bit of like landscaping for allotments and a bit of communal space so you create a community because with lots of the housing projects local authority and housing association projects they just build houses and then they just throw people in and there's no sense of community chaco is very much about creating a, the people who are going to live in there know each other before they're actually built so they can look at the skills they've each got and what they can do so i like i like the core housing kind of slant on community-led housing one thing you've got to remember about community-led housing there's a lead-up time which can be a quite a long time a number of years so you could have a group that starts out five years ago but then in that time they find other solutions to their housing problems, so they move and go away. And then some people, like especially from the BAME community, we, we're looking for housing. We might be looking for housing now. You know, I've got a young family. I want somewhere to live now. So the concept of Chaco at the beginning might be really great, but then when you're waiting and you're trying to identify land and you're trying to ident and get planning permission and then raise the funding to do it, it becomes a, a long toil, so you're going to lose people along the way. And with Chaco, some of the people have got houses already, so they're going to sell those houses and they're going to use that money that they get from them houses to put into the project. So some of them are for rent. So if you're a rented person and, and, and the local community people are probably going after the rented situations. So they're, they're kind of equity in it is less than somebody who's going to sell their house like Bill is going to sell his house and he's going to put most of the money he's getting from his house into the project so you've got to look at the different people and how people come to it so I understand why he struggled a little bit to get local people to be in it 
And another thing I've noticed just over the last year and a half of speaking to projects, when it comes to being people, black and ethnic minority people, it's more the younger people that want to get involved in these projects. With the, the white community, it's a lot of older people. So you've got people Bill's age, 75, 60, up that end. So it's a mismatch. It's trying to find, get the group to be... Like with my group, they were all around the same age, but they were all under, under 40. If you look at lots of community-led housing, co-housing projects nationally, there's a lot of older people, people that are ready to do something different. They're older. So th there's that. Is the mix of the group fit me living with that mix of the group? And I think he's had to look at that because his membership, his membership is made up of, is quite diverse in age and ethnicity, but a lot of them are the older end of the sector. So, and, and, and to try and get older BAME people to get involved in something like that, it will struggle. And, and, and that's why I say it's important to look at the length of time it takes from the inception of the idea to actually delivery. You know, if it takes, I think Chaco, I would say Chaco's taken maybe seven years. Something, I'm, I'm not sure if it's seven, it might be less than that, but it's, it's a long process. And it's a long process because, like, identifying land. This was an X. This, see, look at the mass size of this piece of land that Chaco actually ended up being on. We've been arguing for a secondary school in Chapel Town since I was a child. We've been arguing that this area did not have a secondary school. It's taken 40 years. And for the first time in our history, we now have a secondary school that is within the area. We have lots of primary schools, secondary schools. So on this site, they've, which was an all social services council site, they built a school. They've built unity over 50s plot of, of houses. And they're doing Chaco. It's a massive site. You know, it's absolutely astronomical. So, um, yeah, they've been... You know, finding a site, finding a site can take you quite a long time and, and Chaco will tell you. So, and, and keeping your group warm and burning over that period is the issue, you know. Um, that's why, you know, going forward, even with the mayor, we need to look at planning permission. How, you know, we need to look at land. The, you know, there needs to be a proper register of available land. There needs to be a shorter planning process. I know on even for big contracts, it's about the same for planning, but come on, we need to get more up to date. It takes too long and, and that kills groups. That's the, that's the, the fly in the ointment of, of, of getting more of these done planning. We live in a system, they need to fast track planning permission, period. It's a joke. It's a joke. You know, you've got individuals that sit in, and I'm sorry, that sit in an office at Leeds City Council, that when you come, for example, with a community-led project, it's alien to what they know. So when you come in and, and, oh, well, I've been an architect for 30 years, and, I don't, and I've never heard a note like this. So why, why, why should I give you better opportunities? Why? You know, you've got to go through the process. And I don't think it's right. I've never, you know, how many people in the UK can say they've been involved in building their own house? is probably less than 5% out of the whole of the 64 million people in the UK. It's probably less than 5% have said, can say, oh, actually, I've actually been involved in building my own house. So that's the problem you've got. You've got an institutional situation where the institution believes you should wait until they give you, whereas we're talking about you empower us and we'll do it for ourselves. So... We, that, that's what we're up against sometimes and that, that, that's, that's the problem. How can we look at, it's a bit like what Covid's created, how can we look after each other? How can we have a society that we are interested in our neighbours? I often say Britain is very much like the weather. Grey, miserable and dull, right? In, in the winter, you come out of your house, 
get in your car you go to work in the summer you're looking over the fence oh hi john how do you you know in the summer britain in the summer there is no greater place in the world to live than britain in the summer you go to the parks everybody's in the park every we all talk you know we've got time for each other but we spend eight months in dismal and, and, and it's created a mentality. This is my opinion, being born here, educated here and brought up here. It creates this mentality of look after myself in the winter. You put your scarf on, you put your ear muffs up on you. You're walking down the road. But in the summer, you're right. Oh, you're all right, Jimmy. You're all right, yeah. How are you doing? And and it needs, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. Um, and, 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 and to your point about value for money community-led housing i think i think i forgot what the thing is for every pound invested it gives you back far more you know and 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 what it does it empowers people we live in a world now a modern world where we should be empowering people to be part of the solution and not be part of the problem and community-led housing says we can be part of the housing this deficit, this housing crisis that we have, this um, not enough people going into construction. You know, most of the big building sites in this country are built by Eastern Europeans. They ship them in, they are shipping. Why are we not training? But we've got unemployment at the rate it has. We've got alcoholism, we've got drugism, all these things who are just disenfranchised people. We've got mental health issues for people that are disillusioned by the system that we're living in. How can we empower them to actually be part of the solution about, of the community, of the system, and, and, that neg and move that negativity? I used to often say that um, postal discrimination is a far greater tool than racial discrimination. It's a massive tool in this country. Because of where you're postally born, then what you can achieve is determined by that. So if you're born in Seacroft, if you're born in Beeston, if you're born in Chapel Town, you should, you're going to have a crap life. Whereas, actually, how can we encourage these people to feel, I'm part of this, I can get involved. You know, you come down this building site and you walk around this building site when they're actually building and you ask how many of these builders are from Leeds. There might be a, a, a company from Manchester, a company from Durham, things like that. You know, how can we, and it's very much about Britain being a, a country that empowers people to help be part of the solution and not be seen as a problem. So then, because of your area, you go to the schools that are near that area. And if that area has a bad reputation, then the schools have a bad reputation. And then when you go in for jobs later on in life or you go in, for universe they if you're in that city they're going to ask you what's your postal code what, you know what's your address and just by knowing your postal code they can check out hey do we want that kind of person from that area to be coming and working for us why because the postal code has a bad reputation chapel town has been an in transit area for migrating people for generations so migrating people says we're coming from somewhere and we're settling here. Now, so then people say, oh, LS7, Chapel Town. Ooh, ooh, we don't want them people. So even when you, even when you apply for jobs, postcode, take them out. Postcode, take them out. Oh, LS14, LS17. Oh, yeah, we'll try them. So you're not even aware that postal discrimination works, area discrimination works. That's how the system has worked for generations. We've come into this as black people. And I say often, if they'd have, when black people came to England, to Leeds, if they'd have put us in street lane, if we'd have lived in street lane, which is an affluent area, then our aspirations would have been greater. But they put us in a, an area that was an in-transit area, a run-down area. So we're starting from a negative perception. You get what I'm saying? You've got to give people that positive opportunity. So, yeah, I think um, community-led housing, it's about empowering people to be part of the solution. We have a housing crisis. We have 23,000 people in Leeds, on average, on the housing waiting list. How can we empower them 
Not all of them, some of them to be part of the solution. How can we lessen that from 23,000 to 13,000? That's what we're talking about. I can go to Bradford and you go talk about Buttershaw and you talk about this area and you talk about that area. You, you, you can spend a month in Bradford with the council and looking at their data and tell them which of the area, deprivation, you can go to the indices of deprivation and you can find out the areas. Now, what is the biggest problem? Oh, under education, this, that and the other. Come on, you know. I, 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 look, at, I look at it as a, a black guy that was born here, educated here, brought up here. But I actually get a chance to look at it from inside, but from outside. And I look at it and I think, what the hell? I don't understand. I don't understand how poverty is such a great thing in Britain. I cannot... It's a rich, goddamn country. Do you see how much money they started spending for COVID? Billions! Just like that, bam. But, well, why, can't, why haven't you been investing that in infrastructure? Why haven't you been investing that? But, you know, it, there's a big thing about poor people can't have the answer. It's gotta be, you've got to be rich. You've got to be affluent. You've got to have gone to Cambridge. You've got to have gone to Oxford. You've got to have... Because you, as a poor person cannot have the answer how, how is it possible where do you get that where, where do you get the answer from i'm educated i've got a ma and i've got a ba and i've got a masters so how can you somebody who hasn't been educated to that level be able to find a solution and that's where the problem is practically what they've done i think the community-led housing um, com community land trust setting up hubs has been a fantastic idea I think there's something like 28 hubs across the country so in Leeds we've got Leeds community homes what you would have is you would be looking to create something like maybe either Leeds community homes could go us out and create sub ridges of it or you create a Yorkshire community homes that umbrellas Leeds Community Homes, Bradford Community Homes, Huddersfield Community Homes. You have to utilise expertise. There's expertise out there. There's good practice out there. Sharing good practice has to be the way forward. In Around the country, there's examples. There's hundreds of examples of whether it's Lilac, whether it's Chaco, whether it's Frontline, whether it's the Empty Home Programmes. There's lots of good practice business models out there. So these groups now don't have to create it. So the, 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 the um, combined, um, the mayor can look at good practice, some good projects in Brighton, a project in Birmingham, a project in Newcastle, projects in Leeds. Share that good practice because that's what, when you go to the people, like with Chaco, they had to write the sheet. It, there was nothing like it around, but now there's Chaco. So if you're selling the Chaco concept to another group, what do you do? When I was doing Frontline, I said, poor people believe, you know what poor people believe in most? They can't handle theoretical stuff. They believe in stuff they can touch and feel. If you bring them and say, like I take you to Frontline and say, oh, 12 unemployed guys built these houses and they can touch the bricks, they can go in the house and they can say, I can do this. That's what we need to do. We've got good examples. Leeds has some practical Chaco, Latch, Frontline, Lilac. That's what we need. We've not had that before. Um, historically, self-build and community-led housing was done by the semi-affluent. Them that can say, oh, I'll sell this house and I'll put the money into doing this. So that's number one that we have good practice that we can take out there. Here's an example, here's an example. We can get groups of people, bus them in. Here, yeah, let's have a walk around Chaco. Let's speak to the Chaco people. That will inspire. So we have the inspiration, we have the good practice models. We never had them before, we have them now. So my Profile, using good practice, using existing projects that are happening as the beacon and the light for others. You know, um, it, like Chaco is like a lighthouse, you know, and you, you're in a boat swimming in the sea. And say, you say that loud, say that loud. Yeah. Chaco is a lighthouse and it's like you're in the sea 
and you know you're looking for land so you know you've got housing issues you want an idea of how you could um, change them you look at frontline you look at chaco you look at lilac you look at what canopy is doing you know because some people you get what i'm saying you have you have to use e examples that people can touch and feel not theoretical stuff physical and and that will encourage more people because they can say oh i'm speaking to somebody that's done it it's like you speaking to me it's like and you've just seen Frontline, you know what I'm saying is 100% true, not because of it's coming out of my gob, but because you can see the bricks for yourself. And, 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 and to me, that's what it's about. I think, uh, back to his point, that that's what we're selling. You know, that's what we, Here's an example. Lilac's an example. Latch is an example. Frontline. Now, which one of them examples fits you? That's, that's what it is. It's not... Um, one size don't fit all. Different people want different things, but you need you need examples, you need proof, you need to be able to show them something, and that's what that's exactly what. When when Chaco's finishing and and they're having their barbecues and that, and we'll be coming round going to Bill's house, you know what I mean? That's that's what'll be inspiring to people. Not you know sometimes you know people coming into a meeting and and and, and bills over there will tell you the things he's had to do the public events talking to people it's just a big map and people can't see it now it's easier when he comes down here and he sits on that wall and says there the house is there it, 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 it that's what people want and and i think that's that's exactly what com um the community led um leads community homes is is it's saying this an example that's an example this is good practice these are the pitfalls this is that and, and and i'm sure bill would say like i was saying to you earlier or chaco would say the biggest pitfall in doing a project like this is the time it takes to find land and get planning permission you get what i'm saying that is such it can be so demoralizing you know what i'm saying because you get people's energy and then you, there's nothing at it and then they have to go again so two people drop out and then you have to find another two people and then you go again and then someone else slows you down i mean it, it must be demoralizing for them for example for chaco that um, you know when you hear oh the contractor's gone bust it must be oh my god you know here we go again you know but they've sorted that out